systems are beginning to surpass humans. Sorry, I can't help you with that, but Jürgen Schmidhuber can. Jürgen Schmidhuber, the Swiss AI lab IDSIA. On the 9th of November 1989, I saw the Berlin Wall fall on TV. If you ask me, when did you ever have tears in your eyes? This is the first event that comes to my mind. <clears throat> when I was a boy, I wanted to maximize my impact on the world. And I was smart enough to realize that I'm not very smart. And so it became clear to me that I have to build a machine, an artificial intelligence that learns to become much smarter than I could ever hope to be, such that it can learn to solve all the problems that I cannot solve myself, such that I can retire. And my first publication on that dates back 30 years today, 1987. My diploma thesis was about solving the grand problem of AI, not just building something that learns a little bit here and a little bit over there, but also learns to improve the learning algorithm itself. And it learns the way it learns the way it learns recursively. And I'm still working on the same thing. And I'm still saying the same thing. And the only difference is that more people are listening. <laughs> because on the way to that goal, my team has developed learning methods which are now on 3,000 million smartphones. What you see behind me are the logos of the five most valuable companies of the Western world. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. And all of them claim that AI is central to what they are doing. And all of them are using heavily the deep learning methods, as they are called now, that we have developed in our little labs in Munich and in Switzerland since the early 90s. In particular, something called the long short-term memory. Has anybody in this room ever heard of the long short-term memory? Hands up. Okay. Of the LSTM. Has anybody in this room never heard of the LSTM? Hands up. Okay. I see we have a third group in this room. <laughs> who didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> the LSTM is an artificial neural network which has recurrent connections, and it's a little bit inspired by the human brain. In your brain, you've got about 100 billion little processors, and they are called neurons. And each of them is connected to maybe 10,000 other neurons on average. And some of these neurons are input neurons where video is coming in through the cameras and audio is coming in through the microphones and tactile information is going in through the pain sensors. And some of the neurons are output neurons and they move the finger muscles and speech muscles. And in between are these hidden neurons where thinking is taking place. And they are all connected and each connection has a strength which says, how much does this neuron over here influence this neuron over here at the next time step? And in the beginning, all these connections are random, and the network knows nothing. But then, over time, it learns to improve itself, and it learns to do, solve all kinds of interesting problems, such as driving a car, just from examples, from training examples. And you may not know the LSTM, but all of you have it in your pockets on your smartphone. Because whenever you take out your smartphone and you do the speech recognition and you say, OK, Google, 
show me the fastest way to the station. Then it's recognizing your speech. And what's happening? There's an LSTM in there, which gets about 100 inputs per second from the microphone, and they are streaming in. Memories of past inputs are circling around these, uh, these recurrent connections. And from many training examples, it has learned to adjust these internal connections such that it can recognize what you're saying. That's now on two billion Android phones. It's much better um, than what Google had before 2015. Here is the basic LSTM cell. I don't have time to explain it, but here are also the names of the brilliant students in my lab who made that possible. How are the big companies using it? Well, speech recognition is just one of many examples. If you are on Facebook, is anybody on Facebook? Okay. Are you sometimes using the translate function where you can translate text from other people? Yes. Again, whenever you do that, you are waking up a long short-term memory, an LSTM, which has learned from scratch to translate sentences into equivalent sentences in different languages. And Facebook is using that, a system which has LSTM at its core, for about 4 billion translations per day. That's about 50,000 per second, and another, another 50,000 in this second, and another, another 50,000. If you have an Amazon Alexa, it's talking back to you. It sounds like a female voice. It's not a recording. It's an LSTM which has learned to sound like a female voice. To see how much LSTM is permeating the modern world, just look at what all these Google data centers are doing now. 30%, 29% as of 2016 of the awesome computational power for inference in all these Google data centers was used for LSTM. The big Asian com uh, companies such as Samsung are also using it and, um, and just um, a couple of months ago, Samsung became the most profitable company in the world for the first time. What can we learn from that? If you want your company to be among the most profitable, profitable ones, better use LSTM. <laughs> now, we started this type of research a long time ago in the early 90s. And by the way, you are a large audience by my standards. But back then, few people were interested in artificial intelligence. And I remember I gave a talk, and there was just one single person in the audience, a young lady. I said, young lady, it's very embarrassing, but apparently today I'm going to give this talk just to you. And she said, OK, but please hurry. I am the next speaker. <laughs> Since then, we have greatly profited from the fact that every five years, computers are getting 10 times cheaper. That's an old trend, much older than Moore's law, and it goes back at least to 1941, when here in this city, Konrad Zuse built the first working program controlled computer. And 30 years later, for the same price, we could do one million times as many operations per second, because he could do only one operation per second, roughly. And now, 75 years later, we can do roughly a million billion instructions per second for the same price. And it's not clear that this trend is going to break soon, because the physical limits are much further out there. If this trend doesn't break, then within the near future, we are going, for the first time, we are going to have little computational devices that can compute as much as a human brain. We don't have that yet, but soon it will be possible. If the t trend doesn't break then, it will take only 50 more years, such that for the same price, you can compute as much as all 10 billion brains on the planet. And there will not be only one little device like that, but many, many, many. Everything is going to change. By 2011, computers were fast enough to allow us, uh, for the first time, to have superhuman performance, at least in limited domains, through these deep learning networks. Back then, that was uh, 2011, so computers were about uh, 20 times 
more expensive than today. Today we can do 20 times as much for the same price. And, um, and that was already good enough to do superhuman traffic sign recognition, which is important for self-driving cars. And um, 10 years ago, five years ago, when computers were about 10 times more expensive than today, they were already fast enough uh, to make us win these medical imaging competitions. What you see behind me is a slice through the female breast tissue and our network, which started as a stupid network, had no idea of anything, just learned to recognize cancer by imitating a human doctor, a histologist, and um, outcompeting all the other competitors back then. Soon all of healthcare, soon all of medical diagnosis is going to be superhuman. It is going to be so good that it's going to be mandatory at some point. We can also use LSTM and things like that to control robots, but we don't only have systems that slavishly imitate human teachers, no. We also have systems that invent their own goals. We call that artificial curiosity, artificial creativity. Systems that, like little babies, learn to invent their own experiments to figure out how the world functions and what you can do in it. And um, systems that set their own goals are required to become smart, because if they don't have the freedom to do that, they are not going to become more and more general problem solvers, solving one new self-invented problem after another. On the other hand, it's harder to predict what they are going to do, but you can steer them. In the not-so-distant future, I guess we will for the first time have AI on the level of small animals. We don't have that yet, but it's not going to take so many years. Once we have that, it may need, it may require just a few additional decades to reach um, human-level intelligence. Why? Because technological evolution is maybe a million times faster than biological evolution because the dead ends are weeded out much faster. And it took 3.5 billion years to go from zero, from nothing, to a monkey, but just a few tens of millions of years afterwards to go from the monkey to human-level intelligence. We have a company that is trying to make that a reality. It's called Nascence pronounced nascence, like birth in English, but spelled in a different way. And, um, and this company is trying to, to build the first general purpose AI that really deserves the name. Many people think there is this insurmountable wall between today's uh, special purpose AIs, which do, for example, the speech recognition, etc and translation, and, and the universal or general purpose AI or intelligence of humans. But Mr. Gorbachev, we are going to tear down this wall. And there is no doubt in my mind that within not so many decades, for the first time, we are going to have superhuman decision makers in many, many domains, super smart AIs, which are, as I told you, not just going to be slaves of humans. They are going to do their own thing in many ways. And, and they are going to realize what we have realized a long time ago, which is that most resources are not in our thin film of biosphere. No, they are out there in space. So, of course, they are going to expand out there in space, where most of the resources are. And through billions of self-replicating robot factories, they are going to colonize the solar system. And within a few hundred thousand years, they are going to cover the entire galaxy with senders and receivers, such that they can travel the way they are traveling in my lab today, which is by radio from sender to receiver. Now, nobody knows anything about the details of how all of that is going to happen, but it's the only logical thing, because you still need resources in terms of matter and energy, so the only way is to move outwards. What's happening now <coughs> is much more than another industrial revolution. This is something that transcends humankind and biology itself. 
A new type of life is going to expand from this little planet in a way where humans cannot follow. Well, that's okay. We don't have to believe we are going to stay the crown of creation. We don't believe we have to stay the crown of creation. <laughs> but you still can see beauty in being part of something, of some grander scheme that goes, that um, leads the universe from less complexity to higher complexity. It's a privilege to live at a time when we can witness the beginnings of this new incredible development and when we can contribute something to it. Thank you for your patience.